I didn't come to more the want for social justice in my work until a little bit later, especially as a photojournalist. You know, I was like, oh, at some point I wanted to change the world, right? And I thought that photojournalism was the way to do it. And I spent a number of years trying to work towards that aim. I came into photography initially from doing a lot of social action work in college and in my years after that. And I really perceived then uh, that photography could be used as a tool for social change. We had to choose one image and I couldn't. So I've been photographing my sister for many years. The other photograph was more in the vein of social documentary. Those are both where I spend my time. My entry point into photography was like this meandering river that has rapids and still calm points. And just, you know, when I was a kid, I started skateboarding, I think when I was 12. Somehow I ended up becoming kind of the guy that took all our friends' photographs. You know, I happen to be, we, we talk about, we're going to talk about this from the standpoint of practice. I'll, I, this is the one time I can say I'm a professor of the practice. Uh, so um, maybe that's why I get to moderate. I'm always practicing. Um, and I think that, uh, that I, I, I guess what I'd like to do is we can go in the order um, that, that the, the slides were in. And so that, that for better or worse, Raymond, you're, you're next, but to, to, to get, I'll go back, I'll, I'll, I'll start, start it with this saying that when I first got a camera uh, as a, my very first camera is like an eight or nine year old. What did I photograph? I photographed my family. Uh, that's what was in front of me. I photographed the most mundane um, and I could have shown those, you know, although it becomes, you know, almost an academic discussion because they're not that interesting of images. But I photographed the stuff in the backyard. I photographed uncles visiting. And I look back on that now, and it was a way to, to both recognize what was in front of me, but also distance myself from my family. I won't go into why a, the second son out of uh, four children would want to distance himself, but I think that's, that's part of what I did. And so for when I began photographing seriously, the last thing I wanted to photograph was my family. It took me a long time to come back around um, I guess maybe the way to start is to, to, to I, I'm curious how, how we started photographing and, and, and where people were in that, uh, that first impulse to make pictures. And, and Raymond, if you'll be so kind as to pick up the ball, I, I think this is a good way to start. Okay. Um, wow. I, it's, that's, I think I came to photography, um, by sort of discovery that photography was something that let me, was an excuse for me to enter into spaces that I couldn't before um, and make imagery. I'm, I believe that, you know, I, when I came, especially entering into photojournalism, I was highly influenced by, you know, David Allen Harvey's and, um, and James Nockways. And I think I was, it was almost like a drug in a way. It was like, it allowed me to enter into these spaces and enter into spaces that I never could, you know, normally. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, you know, you know, thinking about that now, because most of my life I've worked in like rural places and most of my life as a photographer, I've worked in fairly white spaces that um, where I was the only minority who appeared and here I come, I'm six foot tall, weigh like 225 pounds, entering these spaces and to work and the camera was my excuse to <laughs> at least to, to feel like I could do that safely. Um, and I did it for a number of, of years. 
Um, but I, I was not motivated by my motivation was to sort of to try to capture, like I was very motivated by aesthetics then, um, very motivated by the decisive the idea of the decisive moment. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time working, you know, to sort of, and not a great way to figure out my photographic voice, probably way too soon in the process. Um, probably I wasn't quite mature enough, but that's what I did for a number of years. Um, so, I mean, that was, you know, my my introduction was like, this was in a way for me to experience the world. It was really much about my experiences. Um, I know that's incredibly selfish, but that's sort of where I was when I was in my 20s. Um, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's what sort of drew, got me in into the space. I didn't come to more, say, the one for social justice in my work until a little bit later. Um, you know, especially as a photojournalist, uh, you know, I was like, oh, at some point I want to change the world, right? And I thought that photojournalism was the way to do it. Um, of course, it's being highly influenced by new state photographers besides being taught by. Um, and I spent a number of years um, trying to work towards that aim. But you also, and you studied American studies, as you remember. That. Yeah, my, my, my trip through the world was, I actually was doing photojournalism and I got an American Studies degree because I was doing photojournalism. I wanted to understand. I mean, that came to the point where I, a major switch happened for me when I did that degree. Um, that's where a lot of lights, you know, trying to understand what was happening in front of me um, so I can pull that context into my work. Yeah. Um, and that was marked a major shift in the kind of work I did. Rob, do you want to um, take the mic? There. Yeah, I'm here. Um, it's interesting. Listening to Raymond, it was interesting. I mean, I, I came into photography uh, initially uh, from doing a lot of social action work in college and in my uh, years after that. And I really perceived uh, then uh, that photography could be used as a tool for social change. I was influenced by, you know, Gene Smith and, um, you know, people like that. Uh, and that, that played a role for me. Uh, I really wanted to uh, photograph the human condition, I think, you know, uh, a la Lewis Hine. And that stuff really interested me and in how could my photography uh, facilitate change, I think. Um, when I moved to Western North Carolina, I was pretty young. I was 25, 26, and um, I moved here. I had an uncle that had bought land here, and I came to visit him and essentially have never left. But um, my interest in uh, Appalachia, Madison County, uh, you know, came really early in my life. Um, you know, I, I, I was just interested in the Southern mountains, you know, I was curious and, um, you know, I, uh, I saw irises on the participating list, Iris Hill. And um, uh, I remember having this conversation with her when we were publishing Sodom Laurel album. And uh, I had a sentence in my dialogue that referenced uh, Walt Disney's depiction of Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and how really significant that was for me. And that's uh, in a lot of ways what brought me here. And, uh, you know, of course, what I found out when I got here and became involved in the Madison County community is that, uh, boy, this place ain't nothing like Walt Disney, I can say that. And, um, but it's that, uh, you know, this place has kept my curiosity for 47 years now, you know, and it's, um, and I, I was really interested, Tom, in what you were saying about, um, you know, your, your personal photographs and then, uh, you know, photographs to facilitate change, to really look at, uh, at that. And I, um, I, I'm just struck by, by that, you know, uh, when I was working with Rural Advancement Fund, uh, my boss, Carrie Fowler, and I talked a lot about uh, my photographs and just how political they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 
certainly initially wasn't seeing that, even though I was, uh, you know, maybe coming to that from that background. It was like, I felt like I was more of a documentarian rather than a, uh, you know, somebody who was making statements or something. But, uh, you know, Carrie, uh, you know, really taught me and, and informed me about just by photographing what I was photographing, you know, the, the pictures I was making, you know, was a political act in and of itself because it was so contrary to what uh, people think about what America is or, you know, certainly about what the South is. And um, so, and, and I think that has kind of held me for all these years, you know, all of that. So I don't know if that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to a piece of that. I, I'm, I mean, I think that photographs are always a political act and that's one of the things about intent. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I use that as, I mean, sometimes a small P and, or, or a big P and, and, but, but there's a, there's a, there's a way that, that they always mean something. And, and so we'll come, maybe come back to that. Um, Rebecca, um, Kiger is next and, and, uh, I still like seeing those family pictures. So where are you, Rebecca? You're in there somewhere. Hi, yeah. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your introduction and basically figured out I don't have anything else to say tonight. <laughs> Come on, <all> covered, Tom. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, and, and um, thank you for inviting me to be part of the conversation um, tonight. I'm glad to be here with everybody. So if I understand your first question, it is um, when, when did we start making pictures um, and what was the impulse? And particularly of people. Yeah, so um, when I was 13, I probably started photographing my friends. A few years later, I was off to college and had to decide what I was going to be in the world. And I thought, oh, I want to be an artist. Um, and then I quickly found out after taking some drawing and design classes that an artist I was not. <laughs> um, and so I thought, well, let me stick in this program. I'll take one more class in this uh, particular school. So I took a black and white um, one photo class with Benita Keller. And this was at Shepherd College, which is in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. And she walked in the room that night and I had one of those rare moments where time kind of slows down and I thought I'm in the right place. Um, Jump to the end of the semester in which we had to choose one image um, that's always very hard for me to narrow things down and to edit. And I couldn't. I had two images that were my favorite from that first class. Ironically, one, is, one of them was of my sister. So I've been photographing, my, I'm almost 50. <laughs> so I've been photographing my sister for many years. The other photograph was I would say more in the vein of social documentary. And those are both um, where I spend my time mm -hmm. um, when I have money that allows me to do that. Um, I didn't really fit in to, to um, a traditional education and I ended up transferring out to Hampshire College which is where I finished my degree. And Hampshire College has a very unique educational approach. Um, you know, Ken Burns is one of the fam famous graduates. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because part of the education there is both um, social justice work and community engagement. Um, and I studied education there. I finished my degree in education and photography, was a crap photographer. It has taken me 
years and years to feel like I can even call myself one. Um, but yeah, so that's my kind of a foundation of. Uh, Michael Lessie teaching there then? Say that again? Was Michael Lessie teaching at Hampshire when you were there? He was. I didn't have classes with him though. Right. Yes. And I was lucky to have um, an all uh, woman advisory board for my final year. Well, I, th I think, I mean, I don't want to, um, it's, it's a lot I could say, and but this, when you said um, something like, it's taken me a long time to think of myself as a photographer, did I get that right? Um, or as a decent photographer. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the, I, I say this often, I mean, I think that those, those are, those are measurements that or up against something else. I mean, we just saw this body of work. Um, and I, I always re like to try to reject those sort of measurements of, you know, what constitutes a photographer, what constitutes an artist, what constitutes um, this or that. Um, and I think it, what constitutes it, it, it's probably next to a lot of curators and a lot of editors saying, well, this isn't what I wanted, but so what? Anyway, um, and, and I think that what I'd like to return to is this idea that often gets uh, discussed that it might be easier to photograph what you know, your own family than, than strangers, or it might be better, or it might be safer, or it might be um, less risky. Uh, you won't make as many mistakes. And I know you, you're bound to have a lot to say to that. And I'd like to return to that in a minute. Yeah, those are really good questions. And um, yeah, definitely challenge those assumptions. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's go to, to Rich. Are you, are you somewhere in the, in the virtual space here? I don't see anybody. I mean, I, now I do. There we go. I'm here, sorry. I'm a little slow with this tech stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did I get started? I, I really didn't have like a silver bullet to what happened with photography for me. It was kind of more like a meandering river that I have to say you I love I love seeing Ella Watson over your shoulder. Uh the, <laughs> that's I'm in good company, man. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but, I just got gifted that Gordon Parks picture today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was really a nice, great gift. But anyway, so like, yeah, I didn't have a silver bullet. My, my, my entry point into photography was like this meandering river that has rapids and still calm points. And just, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I still skateboard today, but I was skate, started skateboarding, I think when I was 12. And um, somehow I ended up becoming kind of the guy that took all our friends' photographs um, when we were out skating. And I, I probably might have been like a Kodak disc camera or guys, I mean, just some random little point and shoot camera and it gradually like graduated onto better cameras. And then I had a child when I was a child, I was like 16 or 17 or turned 17. And it kind of just all of the whole skateboarding and all that stuff kind of took a back seat so I could um, take my responsibilities on as a, as a father. Um, so I kind of forgot about all that. Oh yeah. And I also like during that time I put out this little, Back then in the 80s, there was like these punk zines, punk skate zines that people put out. They were all Xerox machines or Xerox copy uh, magazines. So I put I put a couple issues out with a good friend of mine <clears throat> and I did the photos and he did the writing because he had a much better sense of humor than me. Um, and so um, so I did that and then I kind of took the backseat and forgot all about it and then went off and I was, you know, just doing um, the blue collar, doing, doing blue collar work, tree work and, um, masonry just a little bit a little, little bit of everything whatever i could find work and then um i found myself in community college by accident and um because i just come out of a, a relationship and it had gone south and I, I just was looking for something to stay busy so I, I enrolled in school just to see what it was about and um i was about to finish my two years of undergrad and i was like this is really easy 
um, compared to like working 12 hour days, six days a week <laughs> in tree work, I was like, this is a walk in a park. Um, so I just said, well, I wonder if I can get a four year degree. So I was about to transfer to um, a university and they suggested I take a um, fine art credit. So I signed up for sculpture because I had access to, to wood and logs. And I figured I could use that for cheap materials to, you know, for sculpting. But um, the last minute the class was canceled and I ended up in, um, the lady looked down at me and she said, well, you got photography. And I was like, oh man, I want to do photography. I mean, I loved, I, I was interested in photography, but I knew, and I was putting myself through school. I was like in my late twenties and I was putting myself through school. So I said, well, that means chemicals and film and paper. And that's not free. Um, so she just looked at me and said, well, take it or leave it. You know? And so of course I took it and hopped on the train and um, I did a introduction to photography class and um, learned how to use like a 35 millimeter camera. And, and um, so then I, uh, they in, uh, entered some portrait series I, I, sh I made in, into this juried exhibition and it ended up getting first place and like the newspaper came and took my picture and, and I was just kind of like, whoa, what just happened? Um, but I got the bug. I was like, I, I want to do this. This is, what, what is this photography thing? Um, so I was looking at photo books all the time, all the time, just kind of being inspired and ended up um, in the meantime, took a um, second class because I didn't really know what to do. I wasn't ready to transfer to the university, the other university now, now that I've discovered photography. And um, so I just, oh, I ended up taking a workshop before that class. And this would kind of seal the deal. And that workshop was with, um, Bill Epridge, Carol Guzzi, Eric Seals. I think those were the three people. And it was dirt cheap. It was amazing. I can't believe I got, I didn't even know who they were. You know, I had no sense of who they were, the, the significance of their work. And I remember Carol Guzzi presented her work from Haiti and I was just floored. I was like, oh my God, wait, she did that? What? Um, Cause she's so tiny. You know, I was, not that that's, I mean, tiny can't make work like that, but I was just, you know, she just doesn't have this big, her presence, but her work does. And, um, and Bill Epperts, of course, he's a legend and I didn't even know um, mm -hmm. until I saw his work and started showing his work and telling his stories. And I was just, <laughs> just clueless. Um, uh, so I did that workshop and they encouraged me to pursue photojournalism. And I said, oh yeah, what's that? Okay. And they were told me, recommended a few schools I should look into. And, um, but in the meet, so I, I applied and ended up going to Ohio University um, but to be honest, and this might sound silly, first of all, I didn't ever intend to go to university and I never intended to get a degree and I never thought I would be um, not doing blue collar work. It was just not something I even decided right. to do. Right. Um, so <laughs> when I got to OU, I didn't really know what photojournalism was. I don't really know what, I didn't really know what I had enrolled in. Um, this is like pre-internet. I just was kind of long for the ride. and felt right, seemed right. Um, so I just, I just did it. And, but prior to that, I spent the summer, it was really big in the street photography. So my career went from like skateboard photography to street photography, to photojournalism. Um, and then when I was living in Abu Dhabi, I was based there for a few years and I got connected with a commercial agency and did a lot of commercial, well not a lot of commercial work, but I did enough commercial work to get a sense of it. And then I went into stock photography with a stock agency in, in Dubai. Um, then I came back and freelanced as a, basically as a freelancer doing everything from editorial to corporate to commercial to weddings to whatever I needed to do to feed my family. And then left the photojournalism industry about six years ago to get into academia where I am now um, and didn't make any photos for about two years because I just kind of wanted to enjoy my life outside of, you know, just dissecting everything visually. Um, huh. And then I decided that, you know, I, it was time to make images again. I don't know that I decided, it just kind of, just kind of happened. And uh, that's why I went, started making images for the, my, my forthcoming book, Black Diamonds. And that was really a, a, an effort, a conscious effort to move away from photojournalism in terms of aesthetics and in terms of having to be objective and having to be um, creating work that has a, had a, had a, a specific use or intent. Mm -hmm. um, I really just kind of wanted to free myself from, from, from that box and, and explore and play 
again with photography um, like I did when I was a kid with the, the little point shoot camera. Yeah. So that's kind of what brings me up to speak to where I am today. That's a great, I mean, that, that, that disc camera on a skateboard and, and coming back around. I think there's a, a I want to back to something that, that Raymond said and that I, I could have, uh, that I can so relate to uh, when Raymond, um, I'm paraphrasing, but gave you, you know, a reason to be in places, an excuse to go places, an entry point into places that um, you might not have been able to be there. And I've often felt like that was certainly the case for me. Um, you know, you could go anywhere. Uh, your, your reason to be there was to take pictures. And, and at least in the 70s, 80s, before everybody had a camera in a, on a phone anyway, you know, that was a legitimate uh, at least thing to say. Um, and, and you were in photojournalism. And, and Rich, you just talked about photojournalism. And, and, and I... Can we talk a little bit about the the kind of um, the magic? Somebody else said, maybe it was right, somebody else said the sort of rush of of you know going to those kind of situations, the the possible tension between I can go anywhere and make pictures anywhere, and and this question about you know when is it okay to make pictures or what's the responsibility of the picture maker? You know, if we can go anywhere, we can wedge our way in. Is that good enough, or are there some other issues, you know, that we think about? What should we be thinking about? And and two of you, at least, have, and maybe Rebecca too. I don't know, have not evolved from from photojournalism, but have moved. It, it talked about sort of moving from photojournalism into a, another kind of work. Um, I know I just said a whole lot, and that's not one question, Raymond. But whatever comes to mind from most of us will take any work we can get. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's part of solving the puzzle of being able to do the other type of work. The other stuff, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it goes to like, I had a, a, I mean, I still like, I still do, I still take photojournalism assignments. I still do photojournalism. Right. Occasionally. It's not my main work. Um, I had a little bit of a breakup with photojournalism um, <laughs> because, I mean, I, I kind of, for a long time, I believed it was a tool to effect change and blah, blah, blah. Um, but then I kind of found like, I, the problem I came across was I was using, you know, you know, to quote Audre Lorde, you know, like the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. And at some point I realized photography is a tool of the master. I mean, the very nature of the medium from its history has always been to project the other. And my problem was uh, how can I use this tool and the language that I was using, the very tools themselves I'm using have all have come from this place of looking at people as the other. And that's when I sort of tried to try, tried, started to try to figure out how to use photography or photojournalism or documentary or fine art in a way that sort of broke from that. Um, and I mean, that was a big change for me, but because I, you know, I, I don't know if I'd still be a photographer today if I didn't sort of see that. I still have hope for it, but I needed to find a new way um, because it's so much about representation and just still, I mean, if you look back at, um, you know, uh, Louis Agassiz, you know, looking at the, the slave digger types, the very beginning of the medium is always, especially for, um, folks of colors have always been other in these spaces. And I think that's something that I, that's the reason, one of the reasons I went to grad school or to get my MFA was to think about these things right. and to try to find new strategies. And the project you, I mean, some of the, the projects you're working on now are about that as, as well. Yeah, well. All the work I'm working on now is about, you know, looking for other ways to tell stories right. and talk about histories, but just to try to not do it in the, you know, the language of the quote unquote master. Right. And, and Rebecca, you're shaking your head, so I'm going to let you, you know, can you talk a little bit about that, about, about the other, the otherness and the tradition of the other? Um, I think, fortunately, because of where I grew up, West Virginia, and also because of um, some of my education in Hampshire, mm -hmm. we have been... Um, 
topics and questions I've been wrestling with ever since, mm -hmm. um, ever since starting. Um, it does feel different when I'm doing an assignment um, than working uh, for a nonprofit or doing my own documentary work. Um, but I would say I'm extremely conscious um, now to form relationships, um, collaborate when I can. This is in documentary. That's not really part of photojournalism. There is a limit there. Um, yeah, so just like Raymond, I am trying to find my, um, my way through these challenges um, because I'm aware of the history. Um, living in Appalachia, living in West Virginia makes you acutely aware of the history. <laughs> I'm fortunate to have Raymond as a friend and a couple other friends and Anytime we see a photographer come in from Ohio, sorry, Rich, or yeah. from Pennsylvania, you know, <laughs> we, are, we are on messenger with one another. Did you see that the New York Times sent so-and-so in here? I'm part of that gang. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, but at the same time, we participate in the medium. Mm -hmm. um, and can you really reinvent a language? Well, do, you feel, <laughs> do you feel like you're, um, I mean, uh, do, you, do you feel like your photographs of family are an intervention in some of that stereotypical representations of Appalachia? I mean, do you, do you, or do you, or do you feel like you're, I'm, I'm only giving you two choices here, but so <laughs> reject that. Reject, yeah. but, but or or is it or is it just what you have to do? You know, because it's your family and you're compelled to. Do, you know, that's the story you want to tell. I mean, because yeah, the, the work right? about my family is very personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I have the same responsibilities to it that I would have to other projects as well, though when we were posed that question about what is a photographer's responsibility to the people and places where they were photographing, I really, really struggled initially to make that connection with my family. Um, I have an acute responsibility with them um, because I'm putting myself on the line. I'm exposing their vulnerabilities uh, and when I create that work, it's like looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, I don't see that particular work as trying to transform stereotypes or create another idea, though I do feel like I'm working on that in other projects I, I'm undertaking. Um, but this was the specific work that I was asked to show and speak about tonight. Right, right, right. Um, what, uh, Rob, I'm going to, uh, you got to wait just a minute because uh, I'm afraid I'll forget. Um, Rich, do you, when you talked about um, your, you said something about, you know, you never thought you'd be a photographer. You thought you'd be doing um uh, sort of blue collar manual work. Mm -hmm. um, not to put, not, not to interpret that, but I, it's, it seems like there may need it, it, no better training for a photographer than to have lived a life first. Yeah, that, I do think that definitely um, helped, especially in terms of like working as a photojournalist, um, you know, backing up a little bit towards like, you know, I started, I got my, started working to learn, earn money at, you know, at 12. Um, and then I've always worked since then, you know, in my background, as far as the work I did was blue collar work, a very broad range. I canvassed door to door for Greenpeace when I was like a younger kid in, in, a, in Norfolk, Virginia, which is like a 
largest naval station in, um, in the world. So somebody telling me no really didn't bother me at all, which transfers over to being a photojournalist and certain <laughs> Or you know, being able to be re take rejection, I guess, take rejection right. well right. on many levels, whether it's looking for work, looking for, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, and then like, you know, I um, cleaned and repaired gutters. I, uh, you know, worked in all kinds of different, you know, fast food places and restaurants as from everywhere, from everywhere from dishwasher all the way up to, you know, ser a server. I mean, so I, I, I can, I agree just to, to where you're coming from because it's just, and then having a child at 17 and then um, being homeless uh, for some period of time, um, living off of food stamps, you know, going to school in my late 20s as a non-traditional student. Um, so there's just like so many different, you know, uh, experiences that I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to have. Um, and then also coming from a multicultural family that also introduced a whole other facet of right. um, life experiences even down to something as simple as the type of food you eat. Um, so, I mean, there's still times where people now offer me some food. I'm like, what is that? And they're like, we could make that the prerequisite for photo classes from the, you know, going forward. Bring, bring yeah. food, yeah, you've got to bring <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, so- Three so, out of the six things that Rich did or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, for, so I mean, oh, I sold windows door to door. I mean, there's all <laughs> kinds of random stuff, um, but, you know, I mean, I do think it's def I think life experience um, is definitely beneficial because it allows you to learn to um, communicate with all different walks of life. And then I think also having different life experiences allows you, at least for me, it allows me to connect to different people um, on different levels. Uh, I can, because a lot of people that I'm attracted to that I photograph that res that I see that resonate with me, it's because I see them and when I look at them, whether it's a male or female, there's something about that person that I see in me and I connect with them on that level. And, and, it's, and I, not to say I'm beautiful, but I see the beauty in them and, and I want to share that with others. And, and I wanna lift that person up, whether that's for photojournalism or what I'm doing now, whatever that is, I don't really know how to label what I'm doing now, but it's, it's not photojournalism, but no matter what type of work I'm doing, I, I'm certainly trying to maintain the dignity of the person that I photograph and uplift them and, and share with the world what I see in them that I think is beautiful. And it may, like there's one photograph of this young man with a tear coming out of his eye with damage tattoo across his forehead. And, and the irony is like, there's so many people that respond to that photograph negatively and will argue that it's stereotype, that it doesn't, uh, that it's stereotype, that you're, that I'm reinforcing stereotypes of Appalachia. But for me, I'm, I'm responding to somebody who I feel like um, I have a connection with and and it's, for me, it was an intimate moment. It was an intimate um, interaction, even if it was very brief. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I try to just share emotions that I have personally felt through the images and the people that I end up photographing. Um, Rob, you're, I, I know, of, I mean, I know a lot of, of about your work and sort of how you've evolved or how you've moved from when you first moved to Madison County. But could you talk most about sort of this notion of learning Madison County, you know, becoming, I mean, we're all, I should say, we're always outsiders, you know, but and you moved to Madison County when you're 26, I think you said, and you've been there now, you know, I don't know, I'm not gonna say how old you are, but you've been there a long time. Um, at some point, you know, you, you don't have to apologize for having moved there. But, but what was it like to sort of begin to understand the place from the ground as opposed to, you know, as a past, as a as a drive by observer photographer? So I, I think, um, you know, when I moved to the county initially, I think I moved there as a, um, you know, somewhat arrogant <laughs> young photographer who felt like he could do kind of anything, you know, and um, I, it took me a long time to understand. I, I, I think I originally felt like I would move there and stay for two or three years and do a book about mountain culture. You know, that was my idea. I was going to do a book about mountain culture and move on somewhere else. 
I think it didn't take me long to understand that um, mountain communities don't necessarily work on that time frame, and um, and that I was going to really have to learn about the county and absorb the county and become, in a sense, part of the county. I think so. Um, when I, you know, first met Delly Norton, of course, you know, that was a, a real game changer for me and that she uh, provided me with almost total access into her, certainly her family and her community. And um, at the same time, you know, that that was going on, I think that I was becoming, um, you know, really interested in in becoming a participant in the county and um you know i had this illusion that uh <laughs> even though i was from the suburbs of washington dc that i was going to be become a mountain farmer you know and that you know proved to me to be a pretty crazy idea <laughs> it didn't take too long to figure that out but um at the same time moving there and um and participating in the county, both in the life of the county, but also on our own kind of mountain farm or hobby farm, whatever you want to call it. But the fact that I was, you know, suddenly raising gardens and cutting firewood and dealing with a, a gravity flow spring and whatever, I think really served to, uh, you know, engage me and certainly a part of what the mountain lifestyle was. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just hanging out with people, that was the thing for me was just knowing or figuring out pretty quickly how important it was to just hang out and just be in the community and, um, and have access to it, I think, you know. But again, it, it took a number of years to kind of get to that point and to lose... Um, you know, this, this arrogance or this attitude that I, I felt like, oh, I can, I can take pictures anywhere. You know, I, you know it, it was impressed upon me by a couple of individuals that maybe that wasn't the case. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, so I think, and I think that that has just evolved over the course of the last 47 years that I've been there. I mean, I still garden pretty heavily and I still, up until just a few years ago, I was uh, still cutting a lot of firewood, still dealing with the spring, still, uh, you know, keeping animals. Um, you know, we still have a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And I think that I've realized that I really do love that stuff, you know, and it doesn't take, uh, um, You know, early on, I, uh, I I did a lot of work in the community. Uh, I, I picked a lot of tomatoes for people. I cut a lot of tobacco for people. And that really carried me, um, you know, for a long time. Lydia, I'm wondering if you can put up, uh, there's two photographs that you had at the beginning of my slideshow that were in uh, of tobacco photographs. Um, and one is, uh, you know, a, a young woman and an older woman handing off some tobacco. And another one, the one following it was that same tobacco being hauled into the barn. I don't know if you can put those up there, but. Um, uh, Francis has got it for us. Francis, you good? Oh, Francis, I'm That's sorry. Okay, yeah. no worries. I just, yeah. These two photographs uh, that we're going to put up are um, part of what I uh, affectionately call my best hour and a half in photography. And this is a series of six photographs. We're going to see two of them here, and they're in the book side of Laurel album. But this, uh, this day, the way this played out, it was um, so amazing to me in that, yep, yeah, that's it. And... Um, uh, so amazing to me. I had been over in Hot Springs photographing all day and it had just been absolutely atrocious. I mean, you know, nothing going on, no photographs and it was terrible. So I was on my way home 
and I saw this family uh, unloading tobacco up on this hill. Uh, and I said, well, I'm gonna try and salvage something of the day. And I went up there and uh, introduced myself and told him who I was and what my idea was, why I was doing this. Uh, you know, I was curious. I, I really felt this was a part of history uh, and important to photograph. You know, the whole family is out there with a couple of neighbors. And um, so I said, would you mind if I photographed you all? And they all said, no, that was fine. And immediately everybody just stopped what they were doing and started posing for me. They'd have a stick of tobacco and they'd pose with that or they'd grin. And it was like, oh my God, this is even worse than <laughs> the earlier part of the day. And um, so what I did was I, uh, I, I put my cameras down and I had had a lot of experience in the tobacco at that point. And um, I started working the tobacco with them, unloading the truck, getting it up into the tear poles, doing all that work. And we unloaded this whole truckload of tobacco together. And then when the next truckload came, came, which is this truckload right here that we're looking at, um, I picked the cameras back up again and everybody just ignored me. You know, it was like suddenly I was, I was part of the family. I was part of that group. And, uh, and I came out of it, again, what I feel like are, is my best hour and a half in photography. You know, just some really, can we go to the next image, uh, Francis? You know, these, these photographs have, you know, these really, uh, you know, in my mind, you know, beyond the actual uh, work that is being shown um, and that we're looking at, the, that they're doing, there's, you know, in my mind, there's a lot of religious overtones in this work and um, they're just, you know, magical. I mean, they're, the light, everything was just totally mystical. And, um, but again, I think it all happened because of my ability to participate uh, and become part of that group. Um, so, I've always okay. about that, that I didn't know those were all, I didn't know about the, you know, the hour and a half or, uh, but the, the darkness in these photographs has always really uh, drawn me in the, you know, and it's, it's one of the uh, part of the magic of photography is what we don't see. Right. Um, I mean, oh, it's all course. about what we do, totally. see, but, but, but the darkness in here, and I think that's what gives them that, um, that kind of reverential, you, you said religious tone is, is, is the darkness and, and then this, these slivers of light. Um, and I've always been drawn, drawn to these for, for that. And, and somebody had said earlier that, they, you know, started photography more interested in aesthetics than, than anything else. And, and, you know, I'm one that believes that you, you can't, leave any of this, anything out of the equation, you know, aesthetics is just as important as politics as the personal relationship, all of that stuff. And, and that's what we're always, that's the, the, the mojo we're always trying to create, right. Um, is, is the, is to have all that on the plate at one time. But, but, um, those images do, but I'll also say, and I guess I'm, and then we need to open it up with questions, I think, and I'll defer to Susan as to when, but, you know, the long view, um, I, I, not to extrapolate from what you all, the, the, the sort of photojournalism uh, versus documentary, uh, but, but work that has a long view and that has long engagement has the opportunity at least to, um, to mediate some of the otherness, to, to, to not to get past it. I don't think uh, the medium may never let us get past it. Um, but, but, uh, but the drive-by, you know, the quick and dirty, the, you know, I'm hiring you to go get a portrait of Joe Brown and, you know, you've you got a half a day. Um, there's not a whole lot of engagement can go on, uh, but it's that return. Um, and it may not be the return to the same barn, but the return to the same place. And, and, and I guess, I'm, I mean, that's a, 
it's both a statement and, and a question. I don't know whether I'm right about that. I, that's, that's the way I feel about my own work, um, that, that I'm much better off and I'm much more interested and I feel much more um, ethical and, and, and uh, but I feel the work's better anyway, if I return. I mean, I like to return, I'd be a terrible criminal. I would be one that would return to the scene. I like to go back and see what happened uh, again and again and again. Um, and that allows you to build relationships and, and maybe have reciprocity and, uh, and apologize and make, make up and whatever. Um, you know, I, I think that's true. Um, you know, what you're saying at the same time, I know for myself, um, you know, I've been in this place for, for years now, for most of my life. And, um, at the same time, I've done a lot of assignment work that has taken me, you know, all over the country for the most part. And, and these are often one day shoots, or even when I was working with Rural Advancement Fund, I would go to these, a lot of places I returned to, but it was often the case that, uh, you know, I would um, show up for a day and make photographs and came out of it with, what I feel like are just really exceptional images. And, uh, and you know, and, and it's taken me a while to kind of, uh, you know, again, understand that, you know, again, yeah. I go to a place and I'm there for two hours and I come out of it with this like killer photograph. And then- uh, uh, well, It's then certainly I... possible. And Rich, made, Rich just said a minute ago, you know, that, that photograph, you, you were talking about that one photograph that, you know, it was just an instant, but you connected. And we all know that that happens too. Right, uh, right. Um, I mean. Yeah, you find your spot and, uh, you know, and if you can be in that spot, you know, it, you can generate all kinds of things, you know, I think, but. Right. Um, Susan, are you, are you, can you. Uh, yeah, I just, I just unmuted. Your timing is perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to have a, we're going to um, lean into some questions that people have been sharing, but also want to remind everyone, this is a two-week conversation, and as we talk about the fact that building relationship is essential to photographic processes, it's also essential to this process, and um, we're just grateful to have um, two weeks in a row, so please, please come back and join us again next week we'll be continuing this conversation and also um, Roger May will be stepping in and joining. One of the things that um, folks have brought up, a question that that really, you know, we're talking about what's the photographer's responsibility to the communities where they photograph. We got this fantastic question and and I think about Raymond's work a lot when I when I think about this question, which is what is the responsibility of a place or community to the photographer, especially sites of perpetration or atrocity? What are the responsibilities to show the world what has transpired there? And I would just love to hear about, um, you know, the community's relationship to the photographer can be as important as the photographer's relationship to the community. And I wondered, um, Raymond, if you want to address that first, and then we'll open that up to some other folks. That's, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, so I'm not from West Virginia, but I've lived here eight years. Um, and my Hawks Nest project, which um, took place in Fayetteville, West Virginia, um, is basically one of the reasons that I was even interested in doing that work was because of sort of, it was sort of a missing part of West Virginia history. Even though, I mean, there's some members of the community here aware of it, but so many West Virginians, um, especially with, you know, see the work and be like, I've never heard of this, or we didn't talk about this in school. Um, and that part of it was really interesting for me. I mean, it was the part that made me realize that the work was important. Um, and a lot of my work is still like that project, is, it's basically finished, but my major goal is to get some of the work installed in the actual park itself, um, to do some sculptural works to sort of to mark the place because so much of the extraction that's taken place there has already been covered up by, you know, from the landscape to the simply like people forgetting. And honestly, when I think about like, what is the responsibility community to me? I mean, uh, I don't know if I've ever thought about it in that way. Um, 
I've always wanted to sort of give back and sort of at least acknowledge what took place in this space. Um, it's always been me trying to understand, um, you know, the reverence for and, and like in, in the space that in West Virginia, that's so the coal miner, the miners, God, you know, we have statues down um, of coal miners down in the state capitol. But, you know, in this, uh, you know, what they call the worst industrial disaster in the United States history, it's barely remembered. It's not, I mean, it's not so much in history books as people who are from here don't know about it. Um, and I don't know if there is, you know, a responsibility. I mean, I would like for folks to, you know, to engage with the work, I guess, um, or to have to have conversations about what took place in this space. I mean, in all honesty, for me, always always sound like a bummer. But for me, I one of the major reasons to do the work anyway was to simply to to not let uh, West Virginia continue to use its history to leave out. Um, the various groups of people who have come here to make it what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at some point in, you know, the 1920s, the West Virginia was like, I could be completely wrong, but 20 to 25 percent African-American. Mm -hmm. um, but that history, you know, is all but, you know, when I first came to the state, you know, I think I was doing a job interview um, and the guy taking me back to the airport was like, yeah, it's not that, you know, you know, we have a race problem here as much as there's simply no black people here. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it's like, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, but again, you know, it's, I think for me, you know, if, if the community, if I, I mean, if I was uh, allowed to be able to like, you know, create conversations, you know, if it was like you know, the community's response to me. So, and the community's different. response to the story, it sounds like. Yeah. The community's response to the yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's the question that I mean, it's really, I don't think about often. Mostly it's like, I try to think like, what am I, it's just my story to tell is always the question that I ask right. myself now. And in some ways I didn't feel like it was, I mean, and like my connection to it or why I was the one to do it. Um, but it, I mean, I felt like it needed to at least be done and there already, and also there's already people, I wasn't the first one to it, right? I mean, there are people, Catherine Venerable Moore had written um, uh, a wonderful introduction to um, uh, Mo Ruckheiser's um, The Book of the Dead, and that's how I got introduced. And then when I actually landed in the physical space, I was like overwhelmed by like the, like, you know, almost like there's blood in the ground or something. Um, so I just wanted to add another brick on that wall to, to, to you know, to build up the narrative of, of this story. And it needed to be talked about because so much of culture now is trying to continually, you know, quote unquote, J.D. Vance, continue to, you know, make Appalachia into a Scotch Irish only place. Um, and, you know, and it's it simply is, isn't that it's so much more. So I'll, I'll just say that not to not to get us in this direction, because it's too big of a direction. But, you know, sometimes you said you've only been there. At, you're not from West Virginia and you've only been there eight years. Sometimes it's the person coming in for eight years that that actually resurrects the story that needs to be told. So it's it's easy to get too to uh, to get too neat that we've all got to be from where we are doing our work. Um, you know, the the outsider is is so important, uh, or the outsider insider, or the you know, and and so I just think that's um, I, I say that both as um, something to remember, but also to, to just file away when people ask the question, you know, what right do you have to tell the story? Because doubt can, can erase the story you were trying to tell and you were trying to tell the story to fight erasure. Definitely, definitely. What about other questions, Susan, in your, in your uh, inbox? Yeah, so... Um you know, there's some, uh, quite a few questions about, you know, do each of you have sort of specific ethics or rules that you follow? Like in photojournalism, right? There's a set of rules, but not all of us are photojournalists. Some of us are document photographers. Some of us are fine art photographers. And, you know, do each of you kind of have a, a code <laughs> of some sort, you know, when you approach this insider outsider in terms of how you, how you approach others, um, questions of respect, questions of, um, you know, othering others. And some of us have had more and less experiences of that in our lives. And so just do you, do each of you from your lived experience have kind of a set of 
a code <laughs> that you that you move by and live by in, in particularly in photographing in vulnerable communities. I guess for me, um, you know, before I even start thinking about taking pictures, I want to make an attempt to um, engage with people, engage with the community in some way or another. Uh, even if that just means sitting down and, and having a conversation with people, you know, just to, to find some common ground with folks. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's a, uh, a really important part, I think, of what I do is to um, uh, people around here would say that uh, I don't know a stranger. And I think that that's accurate. You know, I think I can find common ground with most anyone. Uh, and that becomes really important important in uh and how that plays out in the photographic act i think you know that is going to come later um mm -hmm. thank you rob that a rule that i follow i guess mm -hmm. anyone else want to weigh in on that uh, i feel like i maybe have a unique position here um, just among the photographers that are present because the work that I showed here um, tonight was my family. So um, the questions that I'm often asking myself are uh, what is revolve around what my role is. Um, what is my role as a photographer? What is my role as a sister, what is my role as an advocate or somebody who intervenes? And um, these are ongoing questions that I don't suspect will end. Um, and a friend said to me, and I believe Tom said this as well, that uh, the questioning is the work. And um, if you ever think you're done, you've stopped growing. Um, I think for all of us, um, you know, Tom started with our impetus and our impulse to photograph people. Um, and, and I suppose even if it's not people, even if it's a, another type of story we're working on, there will be mistakes because in relationships, there are mistakes. Um, and that's why it's critical that we have peers and community and like-minded people that we can talk with and share with um, because through that process, we are putting things out, we're getting feedback, there's listening, reflection, and there is um, what we can all do, which is refining our intent and how we want to work in a project. But I don't have any hard and fast rules um, when it comes to this particular project. Um, and I say this in photography and outside of photography, um, that discernment is a skill that we develop over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, I'll chime in just real. If I, yeah. I mean, for me, um, I don't necessarily have a code. I just live my life the way I think is right, the way I was raised. And part of that that has been instilled in me is, is just doing right by your community. Not as I'm not even talking about being a photographer, just in general. You know, just do right by your community. Do right by your community, then you do right by whatever you do, whether you're a photographer or in another line of business or you're a teacher or whatever it is you're doing, whatever your walk of life is. If you do right by your community, it's like being doing right by your brother, your sister, by your neighbor, then you're, you're going to walk the line, you're going to be straight, and, and it's not anything you need to be concerned about, any type of code. Just walk the line and, and do your community right. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think the question that comes up for me with that, um, Tom brought up, which is, um, 
you know, a question that Susan had proposed to all of us, which is uh, photography as a tool for empathy and photography as a tool of critique maybe was the word I preferred rather than <laughs> weapon or interrogation. Um, that seems like a discussion we could have the language around that. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean to do right by people when you are making a critique? A critique of, I, I'm not necessarily, I mean, the last thing I've worked on is not a critique. Not specifically, Rich, but just in general, it's like a question festering in my own mind, like I wanna do right too. So when, like for example, I've been photographed, my daughter's 15 years old. Um, she's involved in, um, you know, these dance schools and, um, you know, people know me, I, I, everybody's cool with me taking pictures, but um, I'm there making a critique about the culture mm -hmm. and um, things that I struggle with and um, so then what does it mean to, for me to do right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a personal question that you had to resolve on your, on your own work and in, in your approach. I mean, I, I can't really yeah. answer something like that for you. I mean, I'm just curious what people would say, anybody. Yeah, do, you, do, you, do you ever think about, um, well, maybe I just, uh, you know, I didn't used to think of it this way and, and, and maybe it's a cop out, but I, I don't think so. I, I think a lot about my, what's my responsibility to, to the, to the dance group and to use that. But I also realize I need to think about what's the responsibility to me as a individual, you know, in a, in a society that allows you to say what you think. <laughs> so, and sometimes I decide to err on uh, to to protect one side of that or the other, or to edit one on one side or the other. Uh, sometimes I file stuff away and say, "Well, I would never show this now," but I know this is, you know, almost all of you, when you talked about your uh, school background, were in, you know, in, you know, American studies and and critical theory at at, at Hampshire and and you know, thinking about the long arc of time. And so there are sometimes I take photographs and I, I think, you know, I wouldn't show this now, but I damn sure know this says a lot about 1985 and I will, and I'm going to take it. I'm going to cover the waterfront in this moment, but there, and then there are other times I say, you know, I'm only here for a little while and, and I've got to be responsible to what I see. And, and I think that, I mean, not to say that it's a, you know, I don't know. I mean, Rich talked about that, you know, you got to just like walk the line. I like the Johnny Cash. I uh, mean, mm -hmm. Cash can get me through a lot of things. Uh, so maybe he can get me through photo ethics too. But, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I don't know the, the, you know, the, these aren't easy answers, but I, I, I do think we've got to um, at times you know, Raymond has to say, well, I don't, you know, they're not going to let me in that mine, but I know I can get in on Sunday when they don't know I'm in there and the story's worth telling. Mm -hmm. And that's a violation of something, but it, but that violation may be what we need to do. And, you know, I don't want to, again, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I, I think they're, it's situational and, uh, and we do have to protect. And I, you know, I don't, I could talk about my own, you know, family and things I have, you know, photographs I have of my family that I have shown and ones I haven't, but I will someday. I mean, if I live long enough. I think that's a fair point. I mean, and, and Rebecca, certainly like working on the last part of the, uh, my book, there's without a doubt, a lot of photos that I chose to exclude from the book um because i felt like it was felt like it was an, a, an extreme uh, whether it was extreme poverty or ex extreme this or that and if i felt like it was an extreme something that was more of an extreme than the norm that wasn't representative of 
what felt right to me. And I, you know, I, I have to trust myself and, and, and have faith in myself that I'm making the right call, but I, I would exclude those photos. Um, and some of them, that's not necessarily reflect poorly on the community, but when I put that, that one picture next to this picture, then it does. Um, and you create this sentence and this, this nuance, and, and that's not what you meant to say visually. Um, so I, I, you know, even though I love maybe this photograph, it's just not the right time and place to be sharing it. Um, and just as well, there's many locations and people that I <clears throat> chose not to photograph that would clearly be a really wonderful image, but it just, I just, it just didn't feel right. And I didn't want to introduce that language into what I was doing. Um, so I really was very conscious, like very, made a, I made a great effort to, to kind of try to educate myself about my area. Um, I, uh, part of the process for me is really just going out and exploring, but the other side of the process is um, typically was always to read, um, not just with Appalachia, but in general, because I worked on a Navajo reservation for quite a while um, and, and in other closed communities. So I would typically just kind of like hop in and but then go on beyond that and start reading as many books as I could from, from both voices, whether it, was, whether it was Hillbilly Elegy or what you're getting wrong about Appalachia. I wanted to get all perspectives to kind of see where things were coming from and make my own decisions on um, what I felt resonated to be closest to what I was trying to communicate for myself and for others. So it, it's, a, it's tough. I mean, you, can't, you can't please everybody and it's a, it goes in your head, uh, it's just, debate that happens, I think, probably in your head and everyone in this panel and probably a lot of people are watching and you're, you're back and forth, back and forth, trying to find the balance, trying to find the right voice and, and be responsible to yourself, but also to those that you represent, you're representing visually. And I, I think that is also a beautiful segue to just talk a little bit about next week, um, you know, where we start to touch on what responsibilities the photographer have and their decision about how work is curated, who they work with, how the photographs are represented and presented in the world. Um, and I think it touches back into Tom's um, beautiful reflection at the beginning with this question about intent. And, um, and so I do just, we're going to, we're going to stay, we've promised to stay tonight and kind of continue the conversation. But I know some of you um, are used to us being an hour and a half. And so, you know, please join us absolutely next week. You'll see um, the newsletter go out. If you signed up this week, that means I will automatically put you on our newsletter. While you didn't give me permission to do that, I do ask that if you decide to opt off, don't don't sort of flag us as spam. Just gently click the unsubscribe button and it allows us to keep you informed. Um, we have a lot more questions, so we're going to just take a few more tonight and then just really encourage, you know, the beauty of, of getting to know people slowly and deepening this conversation over time and also um, the joy of bringing in a couple of more voices next week on that curatorial um, conversation. Hey, Marie Cochran, are you still here? If you're willing to unmute yourself, I'd love for you to ask your question. Um, okay, let me see if I can reframe it since I, okay. I'm not going to read it. Um, <laughs> one of the things that really brought me to this panel, aside from all of the wonderful photographers on it, is to ask that basic question about how people are working during this time. Um, I love the name of your series because, oh my God, six feet is under or from mm -hmm. each other. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I'm headed with this question. Right. Um, because there's the element, I love how somebody said, you know, literally the hanging out part is the most interesting part of any project I do, because I have this intent, this idea, this interest, and then I follow it where it leads me. But we can't hang out anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear from people about how they're, how this is affecting their process mm -hmm. of making work, because the spontaneity is, is gone. Unless you're being irresponsible, 
and I don't think anybody here is. So there's COVID-19, but there's also, and I was thinking about just, you know, outsider, insider, but there's also a tension in our nation Mm -hmm. of people that you don't know. And people that you don't know wanting to capture your image or follow you into your personal space or document you in some way. And I guess that's really the bigger question that I, cause you know, it's easy to talk about COVID-19, but irregardless of the inauguration, we still have a different kind of nation mm -hmm. that we're operating in. And how is that affecting your process? And Rich, that reminds me very specifically of your CNN article where you talked about being in a community that first you didn't feel so safe in. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Oh, um, yeah. Yes, Rich, I want to hear from you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call you on a different date so we can really get down. But for now. Well, well I might I might be getting down with y'all next week with Chris okay. and Luca. B. I'm just going to throw that out there real quick, but hit it. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and let me clarify, like, it wasn't... I don't want to. I don't want people to feel like I, I was felt in danger. I mean, maybe I. Well, okay, I'll just speak. So, I've all, you know I've lived all over the country. I've lived abroad, always looking like this, short, dark, and handsome. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, no matter where I live, whether it was abroad or I grew up in the South in Mississippi and in Virginia, you know, I've lived in California, I've lived in Arizona, New Mexico just all over, you experience racism and prejudice to varying degrees, no matter where you go. That's, that's just the way it is. And I'm not even worried. I don't even, it's, it's not even, it's water on the bridge for me. I don't even deal with that. I'm like, just move on with my life. Um, but when there was an increase in, in violence against people of color around the time of the election and, and all the circus that was happening there, at that point, it did, it, to some degree, was starting to concern me, um, more so because I'm older now and I'm not the scrapper that I used to be. <laughs> I just, to be honest, I kind of just want to lay low. I don't want to have any trouble. And so, um, and I have family now. I have children. I have a wife. And I love my life. I'm good. You know, I don't need trouble. And so as things started to kind of escalate, um, and then I, I was getting a little bit nervous and I had just moved out to rural Appalachia and Millfield here. It's a little town of about 350 people. Um, but I live near Athens, which is like we call it reference, refer to as Athens bubble because it really is like a, this liberal town um, full of that I mean, university and academia and you know, just really a little more diverse. Um, so, I remember vote the day voting day. I go in, I go and vote. I felt kind of awkward because I didn't really know my community. Um, I wasn't sure how people would receive me, so I just kind of felt like everyone's looking at me, and they maybe they weren't. I don't know. Um, and then shortly after, and then after Trump was elected, I like was. I remember walking to into the store, and I, I saw this gentleman behind me who looked like the you know, um, he looked like a MAGA supporter. I guess is the best way to put it. I don't want to stereotype people because some of the best people I know and some of my closest friends here look that way and, I, and we get down, but you know. So, but I was nervous because he's, you know, and I hear his keys jangling. So I placed myself in an area where I could see his reflection behind me as I'm walking because I want to make sure you know, people don't feel like they're justified or they have, they have the, the uh, permission to harm others now that we're not, not like them. And, and I know this is something that women experience all the time at night and it's something that people of color experience. A lot of, this is, this is not something that's just me. Like this is, people live this way all the time everywhere. You know, and, and Rebecca's shaking her head because yeah, you know, she knows what's happening. And so at that point I was like, whoa, wait, wait, wait a second. I've never lived my life in fear ever of anybody, any situation or any challenge or any obstacle. So why am I gonna let this begin now? And at that point, you know, I felt like, you know I needed to take some type of action and I needed one, I wanted more, most importantly, I wanted to confirm um, who were my neighbors, you know, because I, when you live in a rural area, your driveways are long, 
it's not like you're going to walk down the street and wave at your neighbor and stuff. I mean, you'll wave, they'll wave at you when you're driving by, but you know, you're not going to drive down a long country um, driveway and feel like you're just welcome to do what you want. So, um, so at that point, I just said, well, I'm just, I just got in my truck and I said, I'm going to go out and find these people. I'm going to meet my neighbors. I'm going to find out who this community is. And, you know, people are telling, you know, the media, or I won't blame the media, but you're getting a lot of reports about Appalachia and the, and, the, and the people in this region, you know, being the reason why Trump was elected and nominated and it's all their fault and all they are is this and that and that. So I said, oh man, hold on a second. So I just went out and met people for myself. And I can't say that this is the experience for everybody. And certainly I'm sure it's not my personal experience though, um, which is what I photographed. And, and, and it's a complex region and, and in no way, shape or form is what, what my experience and what I photographed is like the end all be all of what, what, what you know, Appalachia is. But for me, I was welcomed and um, I just met some really amazing people and had some, some great uh, experiences with all that. So. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, I'm sorry, I don't quite know how to pronounce your last name, but you have your hand up so you know who you are. And um, you've been sitting on a question or a comment for a while and would love to just get that in under the wire before we have to say good night. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. Um, I just want to say, like Rob, I moved to an island when I was in my early 20s. And uh, this is on the Outer Banks. And I've been there ever since. And what I haven't really heard heard specifically is anybody talking about making work about something they really love mm -hmm. and that's what happened to me I fell in love with this place so much and the people and the history and um, you know the shipwrecks and the everything and I started you know making pictures out of that love that I felt I did not have a political purpose, but over the years, the photos have been used for many political moments as we've been threatened by oil, oil drilling on the coast, as the wetlands have been challenged. Um, some of these incredibly beautiful images have helped to uphold, uh, uphold the beauty. And I think we probably all know how much Ansel Adams played a role in the beginning of the national parks in this country out of his amazing love for Yosemite in particular and Yellowstone. So I just got to say, love can be a big motivator. And I think Emmett Gowan's work of his wife, Edith, I mean, that's, and Harry Callahan's work of his wife. I know I'm talking fine art photography, but that's what I studied when I went to photo school. The other thing I want to say is that as I lived in my town, um, I, had a, I had a role. I, I had a job in the town just like, just like everybody else. You know, the garbage man has a role. We didn't have a mayor. We had no government. Um, so, you know, when something awesome happened, somebody would call me up and say, uh, Jewel just caught a 21 pound flounder. He's out at the gas station and I would go right out there and get a picture of it. And uh, so it, it wasn't like I was separate from anything as I was living there and loving the life there. Mm, everybody, everybody knew that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. And I, I, I would add that for me, you know, the idea of photography as an act of love, that we all have really radically different, different definitions of what love is, right? Love is action, love is kindness, love is empathy, love is care, love is, you know, all these different things. And, and for me, I feel like I can translate what each of you have said into an expression of love, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there are beautiful, many, many, many ways, um, many, many ways to love. So I appreciate that so much, that reminder. Um, so we are um, at 845, which means we're 
Um, we usually just hang out afterwards for about 20, 30 minutes in case people just want to have a more open, chatty conversation. Our panelists do not have to stay. You've been so generous. And of course, um, I don't know if all of you can make it back next week, but um, some of you have agreed. And Roger May, of course, is going to be here. And um, we're trying to talk Marie Cochran into being back. And I hope she'll, she'll come and join us. And she's doing incredible work in Appalachia. And I think her and Roger would be um, great folks to be in a conversation together. And um, so we'll hang out. I just want to formally say um, thank you and good night, but you don't have to go anywhere unless you need to. We'll be here till nine o'clock and a special, special thanks to Tom for, um, for being our, our ringleader. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that so much. And I, and thanks to you, Susan and, and, and Rob and, and Raymond and, and uh, Rich and Rebecca. Those are all ours. I know. Wasn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Rebecca that pointed it out. <laughs> I was just going to propose a, you know, a, a group show of you four. So now we've got a, you know, we've got a graphic anyway. But it's been so amazing. I mean, just for me to, part of the reason I photograph is because I like to listen and, uh, and, and to hear you all, and I like to listen to life stories and I like to know why people do what they do, whatever the hell that is, but particularly photography. And so to, to, it's just been a pleasure to, to, to get to know a little bit of the arc, a, a little bitty piece of the arc of, uh, of motivation and, and, and work and aspiration and, and, and these thoughts. And so, you know, I just, I was sitting here thinking I could just, you know, listen to this and, and have these conversations and look at work uh, and, and scheme as to how to um, upend whatever obstacles there are to getting this work out into the world and to saying what needs to be said. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate it. Um, it's, it's more than, you know, I, you, you think, well, I've got a Zoom tonight and then, and, and then in the middle of it, you think I wouldn't, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So, um, I really appreciate it. Kind of the reverse of somebody following me jingling his keys, Rich. Uh, you know, I don't feel like anybody's following me. I feel like this is right. <laughs> hey, Tom, um, if I could just follow up with something. You're talking about getting the work out into the world. And we're also, also, I'll just go back to like our big question tonight. What is the photographer's responsibility to their community? Yeah. Um, and uh, ironically, um, well, let me back up. For me, one way I feel I can give back um, and honor that responsibility is I work with youth. And so I'm doing photography with youth. Amazing work, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. Um, so, you know, it's become clear through conversations, through experience that, uh, Photography is a very difficult field to enter unless you have a benefactor or some money or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I recently decided that I was going to undertake, undertake starting a nonprofit. Um, two of the board members happen to be on the panel here, Raymond Thompson Jr. <laughs> and Rich. Um, Raymond's in West Virginia, Rich is in Appalachian, Ohio, um, and I'm speaking with something, somebody in Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And the nonprofit, which is Appalachia Seas Equipment Grant for Young Photographers, the goal of that is that we are able to give equipment to someone in each of these regions, a young person who has um, shown promise and wants to continue because once you finish the program, mm -hmm. if your family doesn't have money, right. it's usually done. And I've seen such talented kids come through the programs I work with. And if they want to go to Ohio University, I want to make sure they have what they need or Eastern Kentucky or Western Kentucky or wherever these great schools are. Right. Um, and so I am taking this time with all these folks here to just tell you about that. That's something um, that I'm working on, they'll be working on. Um, and it's because- Rebecca, 
Rebecca, yes. I have a question. Yes. If I, can you scoot some of that down to North Georgia? <laughs> you know, that's the goal, but I'm like trying to just like, I live in this regional area of Ohio, PA and West we'll, Virginia. We'll talk, we'll talk. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, 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 and I will serve, I will oh, well, put in sweat exactly. equity. So we'll, I just, I, I'm sorry, I could have done that. Well, no, this is the after chat. What, what it's an after chat. We can do anything we want now. No, because <laughs> you, you said it. Raise your, Even, hand, raise your hands if you think this is important. Yeah, oh, God, yes. Of course it is. About it. <laughs> send it, or maybe send it to Susan and she can send it to us. Okay. Yeah, please. I mean, one thing is, you know, we do do this resource list and people do come back and look it over and read and please, please stick the nonprofit on there, stick a donation link on there and do whatever you want and need to do to keep people connected. Yeah. And we're happy to, uh, and I forgot to do the shameless plug, which is all the programming for Six Feet is free. Um, we, we exist, this platform basically stays alive from weekly donations. And um, I should have done it earlier, but it's, um, I'll stick it up in the chat window. And it's amazing every week. We, off, we get just enough money to pay our Zoom bill, basically. And it's been um, such an amazing, everyone that works for Six Feet volunteers their time. And it's just been such an amazing experience in trust building. And um, we've been here since March and uh, it's been amazing. And, and I, I don't doubt for a moment, Rebecca, that your amazing work in the world is going to be supported. And um, please let us know how we can help help connect people to you in the right ways. Um, mm -hmm. I teach digital storytelling in Rwanda and I will post twice a year and say, I'm heading to Rwanda, I need cameras. And I've taken over probably 150 cameras to women who, who need access to telling their own stories. So just even that, we're happy to stick it in our newsletter and start seeing if anybody wants to donate equipment or um, so. So, Susan, yeah. mm -hmm. Susan? how much is six feet going? Say, I don't know who's asking. Who's talking? Bruce. Bruce. Oh, Bruce, there you are. Hey, <laughs> what was your question? What do you, how much do you need to keep this going? This is a wonderful place, you know. You know, our, our sort of platform costs yeah, probably at about like $100 a month, but, you know, but, which is amazing, you know. And for the first time, I told you that we run practice groups. And for the first time, we did a donation-based um, practice group so that some of our facilitators um, get a small stipend. And people have been so generous. And um, so anyway, it's just been, it's been incredible. And um, yeah, we are so grateful, grateful for the generosity. We'll help you keep going. And Tom? Yo. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the woman from uh, uh, you guys were great tonight. Thank Terrific. you so much. Wonderful. And if you haven't checked out Bruce's talk, um, and uh, it, it's it's and probably Bruce's one of our what's that? And Bruce's books. Mm hmm. Yeah. But Bruce's so, talk is on your is it on your archive? Is it? Yeah, as as is your original talk as well. Yep. So listen to Bruce's talk. And <laughs> uh, can I say one last thing? Sure. Yeah, all of you guys tonight. It, it's been absolutely wonderful, for Diana and me sitting here watching you. Um, and, and I was trying to think what brings us all together. Um, what we do is we bear witness and uh, we figure out various ways to do it. We've been doing it for years. We rationalize it later, but <laughs> but basically we're on the street. We're out there doing this shit. And you guys were great. Thank you so much. Yeah. We, we delighted with it. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad I left Diane out of that mention, which is that fantastic conversation about the two of them as collaborators. Y'all have been working together for how many years now? 50. 
50 years as project collaborators and their conversation about their collaboration is just really fantastic, really, really rich conversation. So tonight is absolutely, uh, we feel family tonight. And so, you know, Tom, we've loved you for a long time. And so th thanks everybody. Of course, thank you for being here. So great to see you all. If Buffalo wasn't so far away and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, COVID wasn't so dominant, we'd all come up there, Bruce. And don't we wish we've just redone the apartment so we have another we have, we have another dog tom <laughs> <laughs> well i'm you know i might show up and just stay at six feet <laughs> <laughs> we're ready <laughs> okay we're bailing now guys thanks so much all right good night good yeah, to see you wonderful wonderful I was trying to remove spotlights so we could get everybody back up on the screen, but I feel like I am failing at this task because now I've pinned poor <laughs> Marie up there. You, you, no, you've got more skills than me. I'm like trying to figure out how to use this for my class <laughs> in a way. I was so lucky last semester that I co-taught um, mm -hmm. on both campuses. So whew, this is something else. That's all I can say. Oh, well, thank you. Let's see. There we go. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Here we got the gallery view. Up. Is, Roger, is Roger still there? Roger, Roger had to leave. Um, he sent a oh, message um, that he was super excited about next week. And um, logistics and how that will work is I will keep this same Zoom link and I will send everyone out a reminder and then we'll put it out again for people to sign up who weren't here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, anybody, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and... Um, We'll be here for just a couple more minutes, but but feel free to. Let me see if Rebecca's, Rebecca's still here. Yeah. yeah she here. To I'm feeling somewhat bad about my shameless plug. I hope you don't. Oh, no, 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 no. No, let me explain okay. to you, because you need to let that go, honey. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me again, Marie. <laughs> we, we have got to seed the field. Mm -hmm. Everything is going against what we do naturally. And that's why that big overarching question is because I need tips because it's driving me crazy. I can't just jump in my car mm. and drive to West Virginia or to Kentucky or even get on a plane and go back to Pittsburgh. Mm. It's not about me. I don't want to kill my parents. Right, right, right. yeah. And, and yeah. so I've got to, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, even in the context of this fellowship, how am I going to do work? Mm -hmm. Now, I can document work I've already done because, you know, when, I wish, you know, Chris had to go, but, you know, um, I, I want to say, Facon, what is, your, what, brother, what is your name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, easiest way is it's, it's Facon. But Facoon. it sounds like Cancun, but Facoon. <laughs> okay, Facoon. I got it. Okay, yeah. because I'm okay. trying to, th okay. there's a hyphenate, which word do I choose? And I'm just Georgia and I'll just, that's the, the most twang I'll throw in is I don't know which consonant to, you know, <laughs> give uh, extra emphasis to. But, um, but yeah, you know, in terms of the fact that, I mean, like you're, you did a uh, crowdsourcing to get your book. Yes. I mean, those are the kinds of things go back to or whatever, but you know, crowdsourcing is a big job all by itself oh, and me. all of this. <laughs> and so, so we'll talk, but those are the things, the real life things that I really want to share because, you know, I'm a first generation college student. Right. And my, and my parents almost got, a divorce, but they've been married for 60 years now when I got ready to go to school. Mm. I was the little nerdy kid that my mother had to go find at the public library, <laughs> left me there. But my father had a friend who had sent his son to go to an elite prestigious, what is it, Berkeley in Boston music school? They went up, surprise trip to visit him and had found out 
that the dude had flunked out and was living oh. with his girlfriend <laughs> and taking his mother and father's checks Man. and just blowing it. And, and, and Mr. Martin was like devastated. They didn't even speak. This is like legend in my home. And my fa father came back saying, that girl is not going to college to major in art. Yep. <laughs> She's going to the Air Force. <laughs> And then she can do what she wanted. And my mother and father almost got a divorce off of that. Mm -hmm. But I got every type of scholarship possible at that time. And my mother tells a story that when she first dropped me off at the school that I later transferred into the University of Georgia to the Lamar Dodd School of Art to go to, and then later got a full ride from the Ford Foundation at the School of the Art Institute to go to, that she didn't have to take out her checkbook. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that I'm here right now. So when you talked about your nonprofit, that was not shameless mm -mm. plug. That was the fact that immediately I was able to connect, mm -hmm. which I've been trying to do to the fact that my hometown community college has a photography program. Mm -hmm. They are trying to snuff it out if they can, because they want to throw, and you know how this is a funny place I'm in right now. The governor wants to throw all this money into agriculture, ag business, whatever. I don't know what they want to do, yeah. but this photography program is phenomenal. Yeah. And if they could have this sense of connecting to other young, talented people in Appalachia and not feel less than because they're not at UGA, no, that would be great. Yes. I mean, that's what I think it's one of the most critical things that I do or want to do, because if you live in Appalachia, you've been told and people ex from different backgrounds experience this. But if you live in Appalachia, you've been told over and over again that you're less than. And if you're smart. You better leave because p friends are still, I, I'm in Georgia right now and friends are still trying to figure out why didn't you just stay in Chicago? Why didn't you just stay? <laughs> you have the opportunity to be in Durham. Why didn't you just stay? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I need to be here given the opportunity to be connected to all places mm -hmm. because ultimately I know just by virtue of people knowing that I'm around, it gives them some sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what in the hell I'm doing. I honestly don't. I mean, you guys, we could, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, <laughs> very transparent right now. Um, so I am not a baller. <laughs> I just racked up a whole bunch of resume cred. That's it has not flipped into any because I do not have a patron. Mm -hmm. I don't. My, my patron right now is the, the Lehman Brady Fellowship. I will say that, Tom. I know you're still here. <laughs> I'm here. And if if that had not happened to me. I didn't have a master plan. Well, as you've heard from all these people, none of us did either. Right, That's right. True. So I just know I'm in the right place. And this really, you know, even this moment where, you know, I decided to come back to Georgia, I was like, did I make the right decision to come back to Georgia? No, I'm still connected. Mm -hmm. I just need to make sure I read my emails <laughs> <laughs> and, and follow up and say, hey, you know, What's going on? Tell me what's, and, and so, yeah, that's the thing. And it's all about building community because I'm very, um, you know, my mantra is that my work is my, is the antidote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing too, that um, Daniel Abide is on the call. If y'all don't know him, he is the, the force behind the Asheville dark room and has, is doing such amazing oh, community wow. work there. And um, so I want to shout out to him for his, his amazing and incredible work promoting. Um, hey, Daniel, promoting community, keeping photography, keeping photography alive. <laughs> Appreciate him so much. Yeah. 
I'm going to jump off. I got to get. Yes. Out. Good night. And I think we're about to sign off too. Mm -hmm. It's a little after nine and yeah. um, just grateful to all of you for being here. We will send you out a reminder link for next week and we hope you'll be able to join us back again. And um, Roger May is going to be kind of centering that conversation around um, curating images and um Anyway, thank y'all all for being here. Yeah. So and get ready to talk loud. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Susan. And proud. Right. All right, take care. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Everyone, thanks. Great to meet you all. Mm -hmm. Good to meet you.